I'm delighted to introduce you to a man that I've been looking forward to meeting for some time. Um, I don't know why it's taken so long, actually, John Amici, but I, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. We got there. We got there. And uh, well, possibly in the, in the context of the unfiltered guests so far, we may need a little word of explanation about why you're here. You're, you're less of a household name in Britain, for example, than you would be in America. You are one of the only British basketball players to crack the big time completely in the States. You also, uh, four years after, or some years, yeah, four years after retiring from basketball, you came out publicly as a gay man, which was pretty close to unprecedented at the time in the context of, of professional sports in America. Indeed. And as, as, as a black man, it, it puts you in an even smaller category of people who have done those things. So it, it occurs to me at the beginning of this encounter that there's quite a lot of stuff a relevant, bit to, <laughs> <laughs> relevant to very recent events as well that you'll, yep. have a, you'll have a fascinating perspective on. But let's begin at the beginning. Born in Boston, mm -hmm. Massachusetts, English mum, Nigerian dad. How did, how, did that, how did they meet? How did that come about? It's interesting. I was just telling this to a friend who was at my house the other day. I've got a lovely picture, two pictures of my mum at her graduation. She went to Aberdeen right. University. And I've got a lovely picture, and she's wearing in it a very elaborate, um, very clearly Nigerian um, gold necklace. And so part of the problem is my mum and, and my father split quite acrimoniously. So when I was three, uh, we left in the middle of the night, got on a plane, um, literally with a... a I was carrying a, a, a weeble, if we, weeble whorls, you remember, remember those? Them, yeah. Uh, I was carrying one of those with me on the plane. My sisters each had picked one toy, and then my mum had two suitcases, and that's what we left America with. So you were fleeing? You were yeah. running away? Yeah. Um, I know. I don't know the full nature of, of what was wrong with their relationship, because it just wasn't one of those things that was ever talked about. Okay. Um, but, so, even looking at that picture, I have no idea how they met, and I, I know so little backstory about that. Uh, what I do know is that my mother made sure to kind of inculcate me with, with a bit of Nigerian heritage and understand what was going on there, despite the, the absence of my father. So Successfully. I and mean, you, you were conscious of being absolutely. half Nigerian yeah, from, absolutely. from the get-go. I mean, I remember when she took me at 13 years old to part of Moss Side to, to uh, a gentleman that she knew who who made clothes, made Nigerian traditional clothes. And she, she had me in Nigerian traditional clothes. I'm standing here thinking, why do I have this? And it's funny because I look back on it now with such fondness. I've got, I've still got, they don't fit me, uh, <laughs> but I've still got uh, those clothes. And, I, and I've had since then more of them made for myself, even though I only wear them in my own house. I don't wear them around or anywhere else. It's not for other people. It's There's a me. comfort to it. Yeah. And your relationship with your father never recovered? No, never, never no. Resurrected. The last I heard about him was when he passed away. And my extended family in Nigeria contacted me. I was in the NBA. Uh, to ask if I'd pay for the funeral. <laughs> that conversation didn't go well. <laughs> Very short conversation. It was. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, from these, uh, obviously not, I, mean, I hesitate to say troubled beginnings because what's already shining through is that your mum was a very special woman. She was amazing. And so although circumstances may have conspired to create quite chaotic contexts, your mum, it would seem, was always going to be a very steady ship. Yeah, I mean, she, she was... Uh, she was remarkable. It, it's one of those things. I, I have conversations still with people who talk about people from disenfranchised young people and people from difficult backgrounds. And, and sometimes a mum is enough. Yes. Um, what I do know is that on you know reflecting back, the toll it took on my mother was quite tremendous. She passed away of, of breast cancer, actually. But the toll it took on her, there were the days when she just looked exhausted, um, which you don't, I feel like you only notice when you look back as a mm. child, your, your mother is indefatigable, you know, she, she's she's forever. And it's your only normality. Exactly. And um, uh, and looking back, I can tell, I mean, I, I remember, my mum was a doctor, uh, June, and she, she was a consultant in America, came back and had to start all over again, bottom of the rung. And, and so, you know, even when, even then, there were times where I remember eating, my sister's eating, and my mother never being hungry at the table. And and even as a mum who was a doctor feeding three kids and, and trying to sort us out to get some independence again, starting mm. from nothing, you realise that she just wasn't eating because there was money for food for kids really? and not money for... And, food and for doing her. everything on her own, which again, you would know no different at the time. But in retrospect, it's... I mean, there's, there's two and a half full-time jobs there. Yeah, yeah. I'm, it's amazing. You, you, you reflect back and you think... I remember complaining 
with my sisters about the fact that we always had packed lunches when we went to 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 Rill or we went to uh, Ruddling Castle. Big day out from Stockport. And it was the real sun centre. It it's not there anymore. The sun is it? Exactly. There's waves in the <laughs> it big was pool. Incredible. It was amazing. <laughs> and and you you think uh, I was complaining about this because other kids got to buy chips from the shop, and it. So, I mean, so naive, obviously, and I was a kid, so I shouldn't like, sure. self-flagellate, but didn't even strike me that I was essentially insulting and forgetting up at five in the morning to put together these packed lunches for the day so that we could go even afford to go to Real Sun Centre. When did you lose it, John? Um, I was in college. I was a university in America, so I was 22. Um, uh, I had my most... Uh, the, the One of the kindest things my university did, that there's a special concession that if family members are ill, they can send you home. The only way I could get home without interfering in, with the basketball season, which tells you yes. how important basketball is to them, was for them to, to drive me from central Pennsylvania to New York, put me on Concord. Seriously? And fly me back. That's how serious they were about me not missing a game. Good grief. So they did that. They drove me through the night after a game. I played the game first. Yes. Uh, was driven to New York... I got there at two in the morning or something, and I essentially slept on a on a bench outside of the first class lounge because it wasn't open yet. Um, and then got on Concord and flew home. Saw my mum for three days, flew back, and got and on with things. And that was it. Yeah. But, but you knew you were saying goodbye to yeah, yeah. the last time. Yeah, you'd done enough. I sense, although the the, the step up from college to NBA is huge as as it is with the NFL. But you'd done enough for her to know that you'd. I, broken I th- through? I, th- I think I fibbed. What? I think I fibbed a so little bit. It's already I, over the I, line. I, I told her that. Uh, I told her not to worry. She did come to visit me once before that. She was she she was unwell, but she did come to visit me. She watched a couple of games. The first game I played terribly. I just had this immense guilt that I've brought her here to show her that I've got it. And the first game was terrible. The second game I recovered. I played really well. But um, so she knew that I was on the right path there. And the good part was, I think she knew I'd. I'd absorb what she told me about perspective. Yeah, she knew that I wasn't. Uh, a lot of athletes, they, they, something really dangerous with athletics, with sport. Um, one of the many things mm. is that they they encourage you to make what you do your definition, your job, your definition. And I always think it's incredibly dangerous. If you are what you do, when you stop doing that thing, who are you? And that's really dangerous. And my mother, I think she was really reassured that I knew I was going to be a psychologist. I was a psychologist who played basketball, right. not a basketball player. Uh, it's interesting you say that because Gary Lineker was here not long ago and, and made similar points. And uh, to my surprise, had already reconciled himself to the fact that if he didn't make it as a footballer, he really, really wanted to be a sports journalist, which is still not the easiest profession to get into. Yep. But it perhaps explains why he, unlike some of his contemporaries, didn't appear to lose purpose perhaps when they yeah. leave the game it, but it's intentional in right. sport it could be, it's, it's intentional in, on the part of the coaches so and, the, and the, because they want you to, yes if if you are what you do the ways that they can control you guilt you into doing things against your will doing things that are injurious to you uh, are just so multiple if you if you realize you have there's a life out there and that however many hundreds of thousands of pounds a week this pays you yes um, and that's football, not basketball. Certainly not in my era, anyway. Um, there is another life out there that can be equally rewarding. That's the other part of what sports does. They teach athletes that there is nothing else you will ever do that will be as good as this. And it's a lie. Because the job I have right now is its everything. It's amazing. And, and, and clearly you're, you're thriving on doing it. I love it. But your mum must have been quite relieved presumably, because it's not what you would call a working-class background if your mum's a no, doctor. No, no. She, to go into sport is often seen as a way out of yeah. relative poverty. Your mum would have been very relieved to know that you, you it was the medical training, it was the psychology that yeah. was at the end of the tunnel. That's what she she, she was convinced and, and knew that that's what I'd embraced. Because you need something that's a lifelong thing. And I'm not a sports fan. I'm not a... I don't watch it. I don't... Did t- you ever? no. So, but this is the bit we've jumped through, isn't it? Is is if you pardon the pun, the uh, the 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 lad from Heat and More, clearly um, larger than the average lad from Heat and More. That's for sure. Ending up playing college basketball, um, despite not from as far as I can tell, despite not liking sport very much, playing college basketball in the United States of America. So, what what happened? How did that um, finger of fate find you? 
I, I remember I, I got stopped by a man on Market Street in Manchester, and he, he didn't say to me all the normal things that people say to me. Right. You know, and people love to tell me how tall I am, <laughs> as if it's a surprise to me. They love to ask me intrusive questions about how big my body parts are, how big are your feet. It's yes. just such an odd thing to say to someone who's a complete stranger. Um, yes, it is. They, people love, to this day, to tell me that I should play basketball. <laughs> um, but it's all well-meaning. It, it is, but, but it's, irritating. It's, Baldness it's is so the only thing I, I could relate to. As, 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 when I started losing my hair, people feel that that's... Something to comment on. Public, whereas if it was a woman, you would never in a million years dream of... Yeah, of, mine's uh, gone too, but it's so far out of no season. <laughs> so so right. <laughs> or, or actually, just because you're an athlete, they assume that actually it's a style choice. Yes, just, or, or an aerodynamic choice. So it's just genes. fallen out just like everybody else's. <laughs> but he said to me... Uh, he, this man on Market Street said, you'd be great at basketball. I didn't know what basketball was. I, I don't do sweating if it's completely unnecessary. Um, Did you play, play footy as a kid? Would no, you? God, no. So nothing at no, all? No. So how old are you now, this encounter on Market Street? Oh, oh, 17. So you were already at... Because you went to Stockport Grammar School, yep. which I know, because my mate, who was a couple of years below you, Asif, when we were at yep. university, whenever I mentioned that I went to... School with Lawrence Delalio, who was a Matt pal of mine. He'd go, "Well, I went to school with John Amici, and I'm not sure that they had quite would, the same." Nobody cassette. would know right over people's heads. Oh God, I feel was, so. I'm sorry, I said. Was really then. I think he's recovered. He's um, recovered. So, so it wasn't. You weren't particularly sporty either no, in no. terms of talent or enthusiasm. No, but, but this I, lad, this man saw a your... man, a man for the first time outside of my house. Yes. When I was in my house. I always knew who I was. My mum would look at me, and 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 I could see reflected back. There's my clever boy. There's my smart boy. She knew yes. I loved to read and science. And I always knew that. Every time I looked in her face, that's who I knew I was. In general public, that is not the response I get. There is a super predator walking amongst them is what I can see in people's faces. If it gets dark and I'm out and if I'm not in a suit, I know that people just think it's danger when yes. they look at me. And so all of a sudden here on, in the middle of a street is some stranger who, who seems to be able to peer and see what my mum can see. And it was intoxicating. I was like, really? I, I could be great at something. This, basketball, it was irrelevant what sure. it was. He could have said Zumba and I would have been all over it. Got yeah. Phew. And, uh, well, I know, so it's, probably a, it's a relief for everybody that I did not go that particular direction. But, and that's what it was. And, and then I finally got, I got to this gym in Chorlton. Uh, so who was he? After who was instruction. The, I don't know. Oh really? To this day, I don't know who it was. Good grief! It's but what? But but what? What was it that was? I appreciate what you say about your mum, but but he couldn't. I mean, mar I, marching up to someone enormous and saying you'd be really good at basketball is not exactly exactly. It, it's odd, but there is something I would say. People always think it's just because you're tall, but no. uh, with a with a practiced eye, I, I would say to you that you can. I do it. I don't ever talk to them, but just unconsciously, yes. I I'll, I'll walk around and I'll see somebody, and you can tell by the way they move. Centre of gravity, you, you can tell by, fluidity of movement. Yeah, so it's not just height. I understand. There's some combination of it where you look, and you can even tell people who you know used to play. Really? Even when they're a little decrepit like yes. me and don't move quite as well as they used to. You can still tell, and I don't, I can't quite describe what it is, but I, I'd like to believe that's what it is. Sure. And maybe it was just he saw a tall guy and thought he could flatter him into it. But you thought... But I was a, I was a really overweight kid. Were you? Um, so it's not like he saw this... this you know, swath figure. Sure. I, I was I was really obese. I read books. Why were you so... Were and you, I ate pie. Really? I medicated on pie. You did? Greg's Comfort steak eating. slices. Oh, yeah. Even, gosh. Yeah. And you were I, almost aware of it at the time, presumably. Oh, I knew You'd it. You'd already had the interest in psychology. Anytime there was a stress, Food. I'm, I'm heading straight for the digestives. Oh, yeah. Still? Uh, a bit? Yeah. Is that well, nowadays, I'm, I, I'm, I pre-commit, right? So nowadays... I just don't buy stuff in the house because I know if I have to go and get it, there's a good chance I won't bother. Deliveroo and these other kind of services Changing are everything. making it slightly more difficult for me <laughs> because now all of a sudden I can have, you know, biscuits delivered to my door yes. in about 10 minutes. But I'm, I'm still reasonably uh, so you, disciplined about it. So you're, you're a, a binge eating, mm -hmm. seriously overweight, bookish, nerdish, slightly. No, oh, absolutely. Lad nerdish from, and geekish. Lad from Stockport, living in a house full of women. Mm-hmm. And someone says, completely at random, 
that you've there's something there, and you decided to find out. Yeah, which took you to Chalton Come Hardy. Oh, uh, Chalton! Uh, right Everybody's to, story goes through Chalton Come Hardy at one it's point. It's one of those things. The street I lived on is the one where the Bee Gees were born. On really? Keppel Road. Yeah, just near the oh, bath. Goodness, near yeah, the, near the sea. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> it's strange, isn't it? Uh, it it's incredible. <laughs> it, this is right next to um, this place. It's gone now, but it was right next to. It's, it's a different type of school now. It was right next to Southern Cemetery. Yes. And um, I walked. I rocked up there in my P kit. So you can imagine, I mean, just how ridiculous that must have looked. The, the super short shorts, the just ridiculous. Plim soles for those of yeah. people who are young, well, older enough to remember ones that. with the elastic on the... Exactly right. Right. And that's what I rocked up to. I stood outside. It was absolutely teaming it down. And I could hear stuff going on inside. All the stuff that I would naturally avoid. I'm an extreme introvert. Yes. And I would naturally avoid interaction with strangers if I could avoid it. And... Um, I went in, and the moment I did, these these kids, strangers, just ran towards me, and were like, "He's on my team." And and I, my heart was like, was like, "I never want to leave this." How amazing! I was like, "This is the best." It, it was nothing to do with the sport. Sure, it was to do with the fact that rather than pointing and laughing or running away, there's a bunch of people who, if anything, are slightly envious of me. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I was terrible. <laughs> I mean, truly terrible, and I thought I should tell them. I didn't have to tell them because they passed me the ball and it hit me square in the chest the first time, and I kind of clapped as I missed it. And then uh, and then they told me to shoot the ball, and I, I looked at one of my teammates. I said, what's shooting? Because it's like, I've never played. It's mm. not. People think it's genetic. If you're tall, you can play basketball. I shot the ball, one of those beautiful slow-motion moments where the ball's spinning towards the basket, except in my case, it just falls about <laughs> six feet short, bounces on the floor. And and one of my teammates, or at least one of the people in this scrimmage, looked looked at me and, and he was like, "Look at that! He, he's never played before. His yeah. first shot, he only missed by six feet." And it's oh, like, what here's a lovely a, thing to say. Here's a reframing <laughs> yes, exactly. of miserable failure. <laughs> and so everything just compounded. At the end of that session, I sat down with these used to be strangers, and they started talking about the NBA. And I was like, "What's the NBA?" He says, "It's the best players in the world play." And my brain just went, "This is." Cholton in a gym that's slightly moist in the corners yes. and smells bad. If there's a place where it's the best in the world, it'll be like it'll be like this, but just 10, 15, 1,000, a million times better. Sure. So I told them there and then, yeah, I'm going to play in the NBA. And, and they looked at me and they said, of course. They're, they're still my friends to but this But this day. has an air of mythology to it or, or even spiritual kind of intervention. Do you, do you believe in any no, of that? No, I don't. I don't. I'm Come a, on. I'm I a just... deep humanist and, and uh, I don't believe in that. I do believe, I'm a psychologist, so I believe yeah, that, that what's important, that, that there is, um, I hesitate to use the word magic because it always gets misconstrued, but there is something very special about the power of an authentic interaction with other human beings. Yes. Sometimes seemingly banal um interactions can have this powerful result and that's what it was in the, in that room a bunch of people who just with their nonchalant acceptance of something utterly out of this world being possible made it possible and, and then it was like oh if everybody around here thinks it's possible then why not you know i've been planning to go to leeds to study psychology at that point and then i decided i was going to go to america but it must have i rewind a little bit but because it must have, you must have turned the corner very, very quickly. You must have changed gear very, very quickly. But let, let's just go back to mm -hmm. to school. What, what was school like? Were you happy at school? Because you sound some of what you've just said makes you sound a bit. I think you're the psychologist. I don't know why I'm doing this, but <laughs> there was a loneliness. It's good debriefing. There was a loneliness a underpinning what you've just described. That the, the 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 joy you took in feeling like you belonged. Yeah. Suggest that maybe you didn't feel like that at school. I don't know. Uh, no, I've made a. I've made a. I've become expert and not quite fitting in anywhere I go. That's yes. that's that is that is true. School was miserable. Was it? I hated school. Good school, uh, private school. It's Academ an excellent school. Academic it's a grammar standards. school. Yes. It's, it's it. You know, I was saved by two people: Peter, who's my best friend, and uh, and still, uh, you know, still very much in my life, and Mr. Greg, right. who was my biology teacher who, when he looked at me, he I, it was the same way my mum looked at me, saw somebody smart and clever and with potential and appealed to my brain and not to, you know, like yes. the packaging. Yes. 
Uh, there's a there's a fascinating contradiction here, isn't there? Because the packaging essentially delivered fame and fortune, but mm -hmm. also fulfilment that you hadn't found anywhere else. And yet, up until this moment in Chalton, it sounds like you'd considered it mostly to be a burden rather than a blessing. I, I don't know that I don't still consider really? that, really. It's, it gets, I mean, it's very, it's very difficult when you, this is so ridiculously self-serving as, no, it's not. as it's a really thing, but it, it, it's difficult if, if in every, almost every meeting, it's not yes. fair to say every meeting, but almost every meeting, you have to penetrate the layers of their disbelief. Yeah before you get to the fact that they acknowledge that there is anything going on in the top eight inches right. of my head. Yes, yes. Um, Just the presumption that there isn't. Always, yeah. always. Yeah, I mean... And not an unpleasant or even a, a, a no. rude or a callous presumption. And, Just and, the, and the thing is, it's not even... There are the elements of it where if they've had experience of some athletes, there's a good chance they've had a... You know, they've sure. got... It's not just a stereotype. They've had a reasonably justified response to yes. someone who maybe didn't think that intellect was the most important aspect and of themselves. And hadn't been encouraged to think otherwise from pretty much 11, 12 years Absolutely. old when they'd have been on the schoolboy books. Yeah. And, and even if they were intellectually smart, they're people who are so, they're trained to be so banal yes. because being a blank slate as a, as a high-end athlete is really valuable because it means sponsors can stick their stuff all over you. Right. Whereas I am toxic to that type of thing because a simple examination of my Twitter timeline yes. Uh, will tell you that I have opinions about stuff. <laughs> and so uh, I, I suppose that that is a constant battle. Okay. Yeah, and, and that will surprise people because, yeah. you know, in terms of Darwinian evolution, <laughs> you, you've done you pretty much one. <laughs> yeah. It's the weird part. That with, with some of the bits that are supposed to be the most advantageous about this package are yes. all of the bits that I can never use. Right, yes, okay. I can never be angry. I don't get to shout. Sure, because you're terrified. I mean, people. in my house, perhaps, but outside of a, a, a space where it's me and my colleagues, perhaps, and even then it's rare. Yes. I, very rare. Because you shouting is, is... The world shakes. Yeah. And then I'm everything people fear. Yeah. Then, the, then I mean, even this suit is a costume um, that if I don't wear it, I turn from business person or nobody ever believes I'm a psychologist but business person into super predator as I said yes. and even when I do wear it there are people who just don't buy it right right psychologist so if you got I mean the number of times I get questioned about the qualifications and yeah. it's like no no really Why well, you don't I really be? look like a psychologist it's like really there's a look now there's a psychologist look yeah like? funny so that makes sense doesn't it in the context of why it felt not like coming home necessarily, but like un, unexpected vistas suddenly opened up in front of you. Mm -hmm. So, you, I mean, you clearly weren't bullied in any conventional sense at school. No, I think excluded. Um, there was, you know, there's there, there, there was a fair bit of racism. Back You'd be in the Stockport only black man, pretty day. much. Would yes, you? yes, until my sister showed up, and right. then we were yes, we were the the solidarity of two. Um, uh, there was an Asian. Uh, Asian child as well who joined the school and that all of a sudden now there's three yes. never re quite reached the tipping point no but uh, it, I don't think it was that overt bullying it's the idea that you're just other um, I was I was other for you know Mr. Stewart my physics teacher who I constantly cite um, as a cautionary lesson to all people who do things to young people yeah. who then go on to do all right um, <laughs> he he was my physics teacher, but he was also the rugby kind of master. And and on my first day at school, he came up to me and said, "So so, of course you'll be playing rugby." And I looked at him like, uh, "No," mm. because in my head I'm thinking it's cold out yeah, there. Absolutely, I'm the biggest target on a field, and actually I quite like Asimov. Yeah. And he walked away and went to talk to the the older boys, and I heard him stage whisper to them, "If he doesn't play rugby, what use is he?" Oh dear! And you suddenly realize you're eleven. Yeah, you suddenly realize that's. Gosh. They think that this is what makes me useful. When did the psychology ambition develop then? Because it, it, I mean, it's almost as if there's a jigsaw assembling in front of us here, mm. and, and because this would be about challenging and understanding things. So presumably at quite a youngish age. Really, really It's an odd young. thing for a British school student to focus on, because you can't do it at O-level, nope. can you? Or even Couldn't do it at O-level, couldn't a -level. do it at A-level. The only thing you could do is do, do biology, chemistry, physics, yes. and then go and As study. As a preparation it. for any medical yep. training. So was exactly. that your mum then that told you about psychology? No, well, it was my mum that showed me about psychology. Yeah. We, we, we never actually had a really explicit conversation about it, but I, I used to go on visits with her. I mean, 
you know, it seems like a long time ago. Uh, GPs going on visits regularly to, yes. to people. And because when, especially when she was a younger doctor, she was a junior doctor uh, and she would get all the bad visit shifts. We, she would always be on call on Christmas and right. going to see people who had a stomach ache after Christmas dinner and stuff like that. <laughs> um, Bill's an appreciation of the NHS, doesn't it? Right. Um, but I used to watch her. She did a lot of work with palliative care. Right. Um, and, and I just knew that that these were people who weren't going to get better. Yes. I was seven years old when I used to go on these visits with her. I used to watch her walk into a room and then we whizzed upstairs to deal with whoever was sick and then come back downstairs. And I would just be sat there with a group of people. Sometimes it was just one family member, sometimes it was the entire family. Yeah. And um, they'd always make you tea. They'd always bring out the good china when the doctor came round. And so here I am with a china cup and saucer drinking tea, which I don't think I enjoyed at the time. No, introvert. Exactly. As well. And I'm just sitting here with them. <laughs> and, and I used to tell my mum, the air is heavy in here. It, oh, it's, like, yeah. it's hard to breathe in here. And she would come back downstairs and then stand in the doorway for a second before she walked in. And she'd just be looking around the room at everybody. And it's like she was scooping them up in her attention. And I just thought this was amazing. And then she'd sit down, take a sip of tea. And the moment she took that sip of tea, they'd fire. Dr. Machi, what are we going to do? How can I manage this? I can't manage this. What about that? And they would just pepper her. And she only had, what, three, five minutes to yeah. sit there. And... And there'd be some point where she would she would just look at them and she would like, you can do this. Oh, Dr. Machi. And she would just wave it off. You can do this. You're going to do this, this, and this, and I'll see you in a week. And suddenly, it's not that the troubles had gone away. It's sure. not that they weren't still sick, but you could breathe. And somebody would say, you're right, Dr. Machi. I'll do this, this, and this, and I'll see you in a week. And I just thought there that is she's doing something there and this was in 1977 and in 1977 the best thing ever to happen happened which is that star wars came out and my mum took me to see star wars and we sat there and at, and about 35 and a half minutes into star wars there's a scene where obi-wan kenobi and luke skywalker with the droids in the back going into moss eisley and um they get stopped by the stormtroopers and they say, you know, these are the droids we're looking for, and Obi-Wan Kenobi just looks at them, these aren't the droids you're looking for, and yeah. they repeat it. I missed the next 15 minutes of Star Wars the first that. time because I'm just staring at my mother. And she's, she takes ages to notice that I'm staring at her. And then when she does, she just looks at me and, and goes... <laughs> so at seven years old, I discovered that my mother was a Jedi. <laughs> and and that, was, that, was, that was it for me. That was like... And what was interesting for me is that it wasn't the kind of lightsaber part of the Jedi that was interested in it. It was, yes. the, it was the Jedi mind tricks part. Yes. I went to the library that was next to my mum's surgery, and I asked the librarian, patient woman, for books on becoming a Jedi. And she first po tried to point me to Star Wars. And I was just like, you misunderstand me as a petulant seven-year-old. Yes. Then I explained what my mum did, and she said, that's psychology. Okay. So at seven years old, I want to be a psychologist because... It was as close to being a Jedi as I could get. My business cards uh, still say Jedi. Fair enough, yeah. I think. And it's all beginning to make sense in a way because the, the, when we started talking, when we touched on the psychology d running alongside the sport, I, I couldn't quite see how one would sustain the other. But actually, it's hard to imagine it, that you could have done one without the other perhaps You'd, psychology probably would have happened either way yep. you'd have gone to Leeds to study it mm -hmm. but your life experiences would have been very different and your outlook perhaps would have been very different the, the, the psychology especially given what subsequent I mean your sexuality must have been clear to you already when you were 17 oh yeah but you can't go public with it did you ever tell your mum oh yes your mum was cool and she asked did she <laughs> she was all over it uh, she yeah knew. but again I mean it, it, if if in terms of the package as you describe it, 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 that doesn't fit either, does it? No. By any stretch of the imagination. It's very confusing to people. Yes. It, it's interesting. I mean, there's a hierarchy of oppression when it comes to, to, to kind of protected categories. Yes. And people find it very hard. People, I know the word intersectionality is, is heavily overused possibly. Sure. But people find it very hard. And so what people tend to do with me is they pick one. Right. So either I am a gay person to them or I am a black person to them. Yes. Or I'm a basketball player to them. Uh, 
and that's where they have to work from. Otherwise, it's like the world is upside down. Yes. And they can't possibly understand what's going on. Because they've compartmentalized their understanding of the world and you've come along and crushed... Blown their, their box to pieces. Completely yeah. blown their box yeah. to pieces. And you're so aware of this. I mean, were you aware of this when you were 17, 18? Yeah. Right? You kind yeah. of knew. But you just know that you have to... You do have to make life easy for people, otherwise they make it difficult for you. And yes. so there's only so much pushing you can do. Yes. Uh, nowadays, we're a little more prescriptive about it, you know we tell people what they can say about me. Right. Um, there are news outlets that I will not go on anymore because they refuse to put down my what I do now first. They won't use a psychologist yeah. and former NBA player, for yeah. example. They just will call me NBA star, which is both false advertising and and it, and it's and it's who talks about what they did 10 years ago who isn't ex just extraordinarily sad. Yeah. Or, or, I mean, in, in the context of professional sport, it's a bit unique because your, your heyday is so short and it does define you. But at some point... But it is sad that you haven't done anything else yeah, or, or, if, or you haven't it's sought. It's not that you didn't do anything more remarkable. It's just that if, if you're not doing anything now that sustains you, and I don't mean sustain as in a, a meagre kind of just getting by, if you can't find a way to intellectually stimulate yourself, mm. to emotionally, psychologically stimulate yourself beyond your sport, then you you start dying the day you retire. Look at what happens to athletes nowadays. Look, look, yes. not nowadays, that's that's not true. It's always happened. In the NBA yes. um, and in the NFL, uh, something along the order of 50% of athletes are bankrupt within three years. Gosh. So there are a huge number of pressures that, that many of these that, yes. uh, uh, young men face. However, the idea that, that your occupation is your definition, yeah, of lends itself to when your occupation stops, you are adrift and maybe you try and medicate with gambling or, or spending as you used to just to stay connected to that life yeah. and lifestyle. Um, because nothing makes sense. It's not sense. surprising to see how you're just grasping for and it, ways to It stay. happens to men in particular mm -hmm. in their 60s and 70s when they retire. But of course, by then there's, there's support structures in place. And yep. And expectations and wives and partners and children. Yeah. Where well, it happens to you when you're in your early to mid 30s. And 20s sometimes. Yes, of course. Of course, you 20s know. sometimes. It is, I mean, it's, an, it's like a guillotine, isn't it? It's, it is. It's and, and you are cut off from this entire infrastructure where yes. everybody. You, and your no one life cares anymore because you're not going to score any points for them. So, however much lip service they pay to the idea that they still care about you, exactly. we're back to what you can do to them. And you suddenly have to autonomy. You suddenly have to control your own life. Gosh. I mean, as much as as much as I may not have been a fan, the idea that I drove into a special entrance, or Orlando was yeah. kind of my heyday, into Orlando Airport, I stop right by the plane, yeah. and somebody takes my car keys off me and takes my car away. Yeah. And when I arrive back, after however many days on the road, my car is there, it's on, and the seat warmers have been on, ready for me. My bags, Roman. I don't touch them, they just go from the plane. To, it's just... Yes. If you tell, if you happen to mention that you like a certain restaurant, you get onto that plane and there is the food from that restaurant. And all of a sudden, you, that ends. Yeah. And you're having to go through airport security for the first time That's in 20 years. It's and really it's, stark, actually, to think of it like that. Yeah. And, and I mean, even if you're well-adjusted and, and on the ball like you are, it's still going to... It can certainly make you lament. It can bridal. make you, you know, feel regretful of this life that... Maybe you didn't quite appreciate the time because you thought it was going to go on forever. It's yeah. a, but I, on the other hand, you know, give you hemorrhoids, warm seats. That's true. That's, That's true. true. Always kind of Who needs those things? Have a car anymore? Swings and roundabouts. <laughs> so, I mean, back to that amazing turnaround because seventeen years old, Charlton Cum Hardy. Um, is that where you met John Forber? Was he the coach? Joe Forber? Joe yes. Forber. Yeah. My, yeah, Joe. My apologies. So he was there, and then you're in um, you're in America playing. What, two years later? Yeah. So you must have been on one of the steepest learning curves in the history of sport. Yeah. I mean, don't underestimate people's... Uh, what? In England is incredibly bad at basketball. Yes. And so this, being, this is not a scoop. Being good... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that, is, that is not a revelation. I apologise. <laughs> but being the best of a bad bunch... Right. ...is quite a useful position to be in. Um, and I wasn't the best of a bad bunch. There were two people on my team who were better than me. Really? Um, by far, I had an immense jealousy of both of them. Um, and I'm still friends with both of them to this day. Um, and they were never anything but supportive. But I had a, 
I had a different plan in my head, which was the idea that I would sell myself to America. So we went to... But this is astonishing. Is this the Jedi within? Because cause, cause on, cause remember, on the outside, not you, you can remember, you were there, but for everybody paying attention, on the outside, you were still bookish, yep. overweight, But that's, that's non-sporty. There's, 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 the, there's the incorporation but, of a plan. This is, none of this is going to be... But it's also mind control. It's not just going to get swept away no. to do something brilliant. Right. There's, a, there's a plan here. So I am going to write... I'm going, I went to uh, London. Uh, I, got, I went to the Fulbright Commission. Yeah. And I got a book that was full of high schools. And I went through and I put a pin in. And that was the school on that page that I would write to. I picked 3,000 schools and wrote letters to them. My, the letter was not particularly sophisticated. Sure. Um, I, I deeply hope none of them still exist. <laughs> no, you don't. But essentially, no, I really do. <laughs> a, because I hand wrote them and my handwriting is not great. And B, because it's just... It was essentially, hi, my name's John M.H. I'm six foot eight, as I was at the time. Yeah. Six foot eight, English and black. Yeah. Can I play on your team? Seriously. And that was it. That was and kind no of one it. sat on you. No one, when you were doing this, said, I'll get over yourself. No, my mother said, this is a strategy. This is a plan, right? You, you, you write, you, you see what responses you get. I had a slightly different idea of the response. Because you thought you get three thousand. Because I'm a unicorn. I thought it's a unicorn, right? I thought I'm. Look at me in yeah. Stockport or even in Manchester. There yeah. is even on my team. There were a couple of six, seven guys. There was nobody like me. Yeah. So I'm a unicorn, of course. Why wouldn't you want all They'll this? Be queuing up. How many um, replies did you get? Three. <laughs> three replies. I got uh, one from a, a school in New Jersey. Uh, I always remember they said, "We don't need foreign talent. We are the winningest." And I remember just thinking, "That's not a word." No, uh, no, we are no. the winningest uh, high school basketball team in the history of New Jersey. We don't need foreign talent. Oh, so Lord. there was a no. From Donald Trump, aged 14 years old. <laughs> uh, and then I got two from, one was from a school in, I want to say Richmond, Virginia. Yeah. Richmond, Virginia. And then one from a school in Toledo, Ohio. And, and I ended up going to Toledo, Ohio, uh, St. John's Jesuit High School. For what, a year? For a year, just the, one year. The upper six, because it would have been back in Britain. Yeah, that's what we had. One year to get a scholarship. But this this is absurd, frankly. Oh, that's a good plan, this. Yeah. It, it and your mum sent you off? Yeah. Because if they oh, were prepared... God, they so must, did, they look, did the school look at you before they nope. offered? They just went again on the build, the package? Yep. Yeah. Wow. And uh, I talked to them on the phone a few times, and that was it. Where's the introvert during all this? Because people don't understand what introversion is, do they? They, yeah. think, they? they don't see how someone who is so confident and comfortable as you are yeah. could actually not be someone who exudes. Yeah. People, I mean, uh, it, it doesn't mean you're It's a shame that people don't understand introversion yes, and extroversion, is. actually, better than they do, because it simply means that when I do stuff that requires interaction with other people, it takes... Uh, people are energy expensive to me. Yes, yes. So any interaction will... will however rewarding, and I, and I love my job, I love the interaction I have with people, creating authentic connections to help people get better is mm. cool. It's, it's just God brilliant. Yes, yes. But I'm done then. Right. I, I'm done. I'm in my house and there is wine and yes. there is nobody... And, and that's how it that's how it has to be. Yeah. So yeah. all it all it meant was that all this new interaction, playing games, crowds of people, and again we're talking twenty yeah. watching junior basketball games. Yeah. All of that was exhausting. On coach trips back from Plymouth and wherever else in the country, I was just asleep. Right. And not just because it was physically hard for but someone who hadn't been doing it, draining. mentally draining too. In a way that your teammates wouldn't necessarily nope. appreciate or yeah, understand. They would be, you know, after a game you win, they're like, yeah. oh, this is amazing, and I would say, yeah. yes, this is amazing, and I'm uh, done. I'm zonked. I'm yeah. out. So we get to Toledo. Um, you've got a year to become good enough mm -hmm. to get a free college education. Yep. And I thought that was a fairly perfunctory thing, I will be honest. I was a little naive in that. I just thought, you know, this, yeah. America, once so I'm there, yeah. it's kind of done. And yeah. I arrived and instantly realized I had no concept of what basketball was about. Uh, no concept of it's it just was in terms of the gear business. changes up from what you've done to where you because this is kids who've played it in the same way we play football. Right? Yes. I mean kids who've done yeah. it literally since they can and walk. also they are so keenly like kids here they're yeah. so keenly aware of the business of the sport yeah, they know okay. whereas I had no idea even when I knew about the NBA and Sally Jones on Channel Four was doing the coverage so at two o'clock in the morning right, on yeah. some nights my yeah. mom would let me stay up and watch it. And I saw all this stuff, and it, none of it made me think, oh, there must be money involved in there. 
I don't know why. It's just immensely dumb. But it didn't. That that was not a factor in it. It was the idea that I would be in a position where, indisputably, there would be a bunch of people who would talk about this guy, this yeah. freak, yeah. and they would all have to know. Yes, I'm the best there's ever been from this country. And you're going to have to say that. You're going to have to spit it out, whether you like it or not. And that's what it's about, being the very, very best, the first and the best. That was it. It was I, totally worth it for all that exercise. I clearly accept that. When you got there, you realised that perhaps it wasn't going to be that easy. No, because I suddenly realised there's this industry there and that every kid is is amazing. Yeah. The, the, you know, my high school was constantly a state championship. Uh, Which is why they got in touch with you. And them. I did not realise... I'm running for the first time. I mean, not on the court. I mean, round a track. Yes. I'm like, what is this? Lifting weights. I'd never heard of that. I'm lifting weights and I'm running and I'm doing practice as well. Did you hate it? Every single day. And I, I just, I hated the initial part because yeah. I couldn't believe that what I'd done with my body, which was already reasonably transformed from, yes. from just the amount of two times a week and a game on the weekend. And a few fewer pies. And a lot fewer pies, yeah. that, that's for sure. My mother was like, if you're going to do this, and no, no more pies. <laughs> and, and then suddenly I'm in America, and there's two a days in the summer. Yeah. And there's, when, the, when the season starts and the school year starts, um, the basketball team is paraded in front of everybody and you suddenly realise the pressure is on and you're supposed to win. A and it's not just the school, it's the town, isn't it? I yeah, mean, this the is thing. the thing we don't get in this country. Mm -hmm. is the, I mean, college football and basketball even more so. But, yep. but it is a, it's a centre, it's the bloodstream of the community. But my high school gym was a 2,000-seat arena. <laughs> Incredible. That was full of people. Yeah. Uh, who both came to watch St. John's, which was a perennial competitor, but also came to watch all the other people that came through because mm. the, the the City League, as it's, it was called, is just immensely challenging. So many great players came out of that kind of tiny little... Well, it's not a town, is it? It's a, it's a city, but it's it's such a... It's almost like you'd expect the office to be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I say back, it, about a relative backwater, yeah, albeit, albeit, you yeah. know, but conurbation. Remar remarkable in terms of their verve for the sport. So when did... When did it click? When did you think, yeah, I am going to be all right? Because did you, and and how did you respond to the shock? Did you did you throw yourself into it, or did you have a period of disillusion? Or, or? no, I, th I think for me it was slightly easier because I knew that when I left, my mother was in remission. Right. Um, but I also knew that I'm not going to every day that I spend away. It, these are days I will never get back, and potentially. Yeah. Uh, okay, it'll be done. So, yes. so I'm not going to waste. We spent two thousand pounds on that. Two thousand pounds on, on the flight, the, sc the school tuition. The I just remember it was being an it was an investment that we talked about around the dinner table. Really, that there was stuff that my sisters would not get, so that I could do this. And so, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a throwaway to be there. It wasn't a. I had no sense of entitlement to it. I knew I, I was stepping on my sisters aspirations even if they're only small things that they yes, didn't get and they never shared with me what they didn't get no but i was never i wasn't going to miss my time with my mum and then waste this opportunity so i just i mean very I, mature well, that's my mum right there is it yeah she was she had us you know cooking meals at seven and eight and right and yeah she wouldn't let me leave for america until i knew how to make every meal that she made uh, she would not be proud of the fact that I do not cook now. But, uh, but. Well, she might be proud of the reasons why. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, so it, it, it happened. How, how? I mean, do you remember when you found out you'd got your scholarship? Yes, because they came into the uh, they came to the school, and uh, that all the calls went through the, the kind of the, the coach's office, and I got a call, and they said, "Yes, we're going to offer you a scholarship and to Vanderbilt University." Um, and I thought this was amazing, and I'd done it, and I called my mum, and we had a little weep, and then there's a big signing day where the, the a member, a representative of the university comes to your school, if you're a big enough, if yeah, it's yeah. a big enough school, and they do pictures for the, the Toledo Blade, the, the, the newspaper. Uh, it was really proud. Then suddenly, you, you do it before the end of your season, your yeah. high school season, so now there's a target on you because you're a scholarship kid. You're a guy who's going to go right, to a big are. school, so yes. now everybody's gunning for you. Yes. They want to make their mark because they think if they can beat up on someone who's got a scholarship, then maybe they get a chance. So yeah. it just makes your life a little more difficult. But you coped. I did. It, I had an amazing team around me. Did you enjoy playing? Because you haven't mentioned enjoying playing basketball yet, and we've been here 45 minutes. Mm. I enjoy winning. 
I, I, I see. And 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 sport as a means to an end, or not even that. When it's used properly, yes, strategically, it can do amazing things. But but you don't have that transformational sense that, that that's people watching, let alone playing sports. Sometimes it takes us out of ourselves. I haven't heard that from you at all. No, I don't know if it took me out of myself. I don't know if you it, wanted to it's be taken a, out. Of it's a, it let you be. It's you. a tool. Yeah, it, it's a tool to 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 deliver an outcome that I had, and that outcome was playing in the NBA, was being the first Brit to have a career in the NBA. And That's, you were. I mean, you became the, the thing you dreamt of being. You that delivered the, that message. Did it ever bother you that it didn't curry more? Impact back in Blighty, did it? Yeah. Ever, did it's, it? It's a continual irritation to me, though. Because there was a there was a British lad in the Super Bowl two nights ago, yep. wasn't there? And and I've already forgotten his name. Forget AJE. Yeah. AJ, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you see what I mean? Yep. It's the same. Nothing's changed. Yeah, really. no, nobody really cares. No, <laughs> but, I mean, part, for me, it's 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 less of a challenge. I think what bothers me is that the basketball community here carries me zero respect. Well, that's just so silly. Um, uh, it's because I'm a big critic of, of the sport in this okay. country. It's yes. because I think that young people, there are so many, even on the walk here from the, the just around the corner of the tube station, Old Street, and I walk past these people, I'm like, you, 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 like six years, I could turn you from that into an NBA player. Yeah. And I'm no stellar coach. Sure. It's just I. there's a pathway that could be provided that yes. would make that happen. And they're just not doing it. And in it. this country, we don't have any players no. Who head out that way. And it's because the infrastructure is bad, the coaching band, whatever else. But I suppose that's an irritation for me. But, but I, dealing I, I at the time, once you once your dream started to come true, presumably you can't, there must have been a tiny bit of you, John, that was expecting ticker tape parades and red carpets at Heathrow. Um, Just a tiny bit. I, I think I kind of expected... Or Manchester uh, to Piccadilly. be a little bit inspirational in just yes. in, within the sport. Okay, so you weren't looking for but I'm, I, I am, pats on the back. No, were, God, you no. Were looking for influence. No, because I didn't do it for other people. No, I know you didn't, but yeah. still, you did. Did you articulated a desire to be the best they'd ever been from this country? But and there's a sense that the country yeah. never noticed. The, well, yeah, they didn't. See, this is the thing. That's why they're irritated. I think the, the, that the country didn't notice is perfectly acceptable. Right, people are allowed not to be interested in basketball. If you're interested in basketball. And you imagine in your head that somehow I'm just not as good as 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 any other person who plays in the NBA. Yeah. That delusion is irritating yes, to me. Of course it is. Uh, but the idea that random people on the street say, "Oh, uh, you know, I never didn't know you played basketball." It happens a lot nowadays. And I I'm really I'm so proud when people know me as a psychologist yes, and not as a basketball of player. Course. It's like yes, of course. that's what I want. Are you happier now than you were playing basketball? Oh, God, yeah. Professionally fulfilled, but also personally happier. Uh, I'm always good on contentment. Yes. I mean, I'm not. You're I'm, lucky. I'm. I'm. Well, I say you're I'm, lucky. I'm, you, I'm pretty flat it in terms work, of my affect. It? I don't. I don't go for the big highs and the big lows. Right. But I do a job now with colleagues now that where we have this intellectual interaction um, a real connection and we deliver really insightful good work for people and i'm like this is i used to put a ball in a hole for a living mm. i mean mm. think about that when you boil down your job <laughs> and you suddenly realize i put a ball in a hole for a living and yes. and i only did that about 50 percent of the time less than that actually but let's <laughs> say 50 percent of the time you suddenly realize there's no there's no intrinsic nobility in that we try and make it out as it but there's no nobility there there are things that happen through sport that I will never, ever forget. My meeting my kids it makes people think that yeah. sounds odd, but you know, adopting my kids and and there's lots of little times where I remember the interactions that I had that were only possible because I had that NBA got yeah yes. badge on so my it's chest. It's a key. It's not a door or a. It's a. But it's, that's it's, yes, yeah. I understand. I that. use it, not it. Use me. Yes. Yes. And. I just we should touch on this story as well because it speaks to you finding a nobility in a sport where you didn't think there was any nobility. Tell, tell me why you turned down just hmm. shy of twenty million bucks from from another NBA team. Um, yeah, this one, this one. Hurts. The Lakers came in, didn't Still they? The Los Angeles Lakers. Yeah, and I really wanted to play there. Even I've heard of them. I really <laughs> wanted to play there. They had an amazing coach who was cerebral. He was just known as a kind of a, a wizard kind of guy in terms of his brain. Uh, very, um, very smart and sharp, and and I I I just knew we'd click. Um, they offered me a big contract after an amazing year with the Orlando Magic, uh, but the year before, nobody wanted me. 
the scouting report on me was he can't jump, he only goes left, and he's English. I don't know quite how and he's English played in, no, but, still. but it was always in there. Yeah. And yet Orlando and Doc <laughs> Rivers, the coach at the time, he gave me my shot, and I took my shot, and I ended up starting on that team and and you know being a significant part. And then the year afterwards, they asked me to stay. The team and Doc Rivers asked me to stay, yeah. even though they couldn't pay me what I deserved um, market value. And then I, so I said yes, and people think it's about loyalty, and it's not loyalty, because loyalty is a really toxic, yes. really toxic concept. It's about principle, because I knew that there's a good chance they'd screw me the year after if I wasn't outstanding there's a good chance they wouldn't offer me a big contract to make up for the fact that mm. they hadn't previously. And that's exactly what happened. But it doesn't matter. Because you if it's loyalty, to yourself. That would have been something broken. Yes, of course. But instead, it was something reinforced. Yes. Because I was principled, even though the other party wasn't principled in return. Uh, uh, and uh, I knew it. And, and it's also, if I've understood you correctly, it wouldn't have been a noble act or an act of principle if you'd done it in expectation of reciprocation. It exactly. Became, then it becomes a transaction. Exactly. Exactly. So, and I didn't want to, I mean, oh. Well, what are you thinking of now? What are you wistful about? Playing for the Lakers? Playing, or, or just, just four championship rings. Gosh. That they won in those seven years. And I, we knew that they would. They had yes. Kobe Bryant. They had Shaquille O'Neal. I had, I, all I'd have to be was a backup. Right. I could have just sat on the bench and played eight minutes. And I knew that. And they'd pay me a ton of money to do it. Yeah. And I'd be living in Los Angeles. Heat. Sure. Um, and West Hollywood, which I was also intrigued by at the time. Um, <laughs> well, this is, we're not going to have time. We're going to run out of time. And I, need, I owe you an apology because I think I fell into a trap that you spent your whole life looking at when I listed all the things that, that made you interesting at the beginning of this conversation. And we've touched on precisely none of them. <sighs> we haven't really, apart from obviously your stature but we haven't touched upon your race because mm -hmm. i thought we'd talk about the colin copernic stories and the and we haven't really touched upon your sexuality and um and i i can't remember an hour of my life that's gone by quite this quickly which kind of proves something doesn't it I hope. Uh, something that you've spent your whole life demonstrating which is i am much more than the sum of my parts or i am much more than what you initially see yeah but i would on, on the question of, of, of you being gay, mm -hmm. just because there will be people watching this, particularly people of colour who still feel stigmatised. You've had people come up to you and yep. say, I didn't know black men could be gay. So when you made the decision, first of all, how, how did you... I mean, what was your love life like from, from the age of 16, 17 <laughs> to the age of 26, 27? Non-existent. Nothing I, at all. I, I, put, um, I put my life in a box right. and, and literally shoved it under the bed. And it was not so much uh, because, oh, this is such a dangerous, toxic thing. It was actually because I'm not good enough um, to stay and compete at this level and and be frivolous. Uh, okay. I just, I don't, I can't have the mental capacity. So even if you'd been straight, stuff. you would have parked it. Oh, think? yeah. Okay. I would have had to because I, I, I was, if you think of athletes, uh, somebody like, uh, Gary Lineker is, uh, probably, you know, he's, he's up there in the in the nineties to hundred in terms of uh, his well, he wouldn't capability. Say so. I'd go for George Best. I, George Best yeah. or <laughs> Messi or any of these yes, people. Yes, I was a seventy-six. Right, you are out of hundred. Okay, and if if I wasn't on it, then I would get my butt kicked. Yeah. So I just couldn't afford to. to so have so that it wasn't a political. It wasn't fear, or it was literally no, pragmatism. Yeah, yeah, and and even later into my career. Um, when I started to have a life, I met some some fun people, not not just gay people, but some yes. fun people. I was like, ah. And so I was out uh, in my career to some of my teammates. Right. Just like most people, most gay people are out to not everybody. No, of course. They may wear the T-shirt during the parade, but yes. many people don't, don't do the parade. Yes. Um, and so I, I was out to family, friends, uh, okay. teammates, some of them, who I thought weren't jerks. Yeah. Um, but not everybody. And I didn't really have an intention of coming out to everybody until I got back to Manchester one summer and I saw uh, Ian McKellen, who's oh, yeah. the Grand Marshal, yeah. leather pants, pink Cadillac, everything you'd expect, perhaps. And, and, and I, was, I was stood in the, the grounds of Manchester Cathedral because was, there was no crowd there. And it's a bit raised, you can see the road. And I see there's a kid in the cathedral with me, like, ducking down behind tombstones and 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 then 
Ian is doing his wave in different directions. And he waves in our general direction, clearly not at us. Yeah. And this kid rises up and waves. And I'm like, well, look at that. How much it means. Look at that. And it's not, I don't flatter myself. I know I'm not Ian McKellen stature. Um, but I also know that there are less role models yes. who might bust a box or two in the gay community. People do tend to think that we are either Alan Carr or yes. or, or somebody else who's 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 mainstream and safe and funny and i'm a little less so of course so because it's a, just a human condition and you're a human you're just a slightly different human from the yeah. from the sort of predictable so that's what made me want to come out publicly anyway so that maybe maybe there'd be a kid that rises a little bit how long before a, a professional british famous sportsman or a premier league player comes out do you think there are already uh, quite a few Premier League football players who are out in the same way that, is that right? most gay people are out, which is to family, friends, some of their teammates, and even some in the media. Um, but the idea that they're going to come out publicly, uh, their sport is way behind. Yes, it is, I had a conversation it? with Greg Clark that, you know, he, he told me that the last guy, the BBC, uh, the guy from the BBC who used to run football, uh, Premier League, yeah. Uh, sorry, FA. Uh, he got fired because he tried to change things too quickly, and he's not going to get fired for that diversity stuff. No. And so they've no interest in it. They're the they're the, they're the there's sachi. no gain. There's no gain. There's the there? sat. They're the sachi of 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 sports right. leagues. They yes. they make great posters. Yes. Don't be nasty to gay people. Don't be nasty to black people. Don't throw bananas. But they don't, there's no substance behind it. There's an incongruence between their rhetoric and how they actually behave. Well, it's actions versus words, so, isn't it? And would you say would the you... same of the race side of it as well? Though? Oh, yeah, yeah. I so, mean, it's, it's, it's a lot done... better than it was. I was reading the Cyril Regis stuff after he passed away, and, and I vaguely remember that. I, I, you know, growing up in the Midlands in the 70s, yeah. Cyril Regis was, was a hero. But there's been enormous progress, but you're suggesting that, it, mm. it, that, 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 that sport in Britain has improved by accident as a result of social change rather than being an engine of change. I agree, but I would also challenge people that and progress is a tool for the status quo. It, it, progress is how you stop real change from happening, by focusing on progress, because then it means the infinitesimal, almost imperceptible changes can be lauded as, look, look, we're on our way. Yes. No more bananas on the field. I mean, how... That, that, that's we, progress, what are we right? Celebrating exactly? It's progress, but but managers, black managers, are on a clear one in, one out mm. basis in that that league. Uh, there are so many other areas where you look at them, and it's very clear that for the number of of high quality black minds that have come through the sport, yes. whether as players or coaches, they don't penetrate anywhere into the administration. They don't seem to get into leadership. This is not an accident. You know, the, this is this is a systemic thing, but as long as we can t keep talking about the fact that bananas aren't being thrown on the field, like it's a, right. like that's a success criteria, of course. it stops us from really focusing on what what's real change. You can stand on change. Yeah, you can build on change. Progress is is just an uphill climb that you're constantly scaling against, and people rain down on you these these infinitesimal pieces of tokens, progress tokens, tokens yes. as a way to. Aren't you satisfied now? Yeah, of course. Well, there's no bananas. Now go away. Aren't you satisfied now? Because we've done this. You know, we, we've we've held up a, a complaint against somebody who yelled something anti-Semitic. Aren't you satisfied now? Yeah. Well, no, no. Take a stand. Have a principle. Take a stand. Have a principle. Mm -hmm. Something you've never struggled with. No, I enjoy that part. John Amici, that was brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you so much. 